So, boats, planes, and scary things. And I started thinking about scary things. And this past weekend, Greg, you'll really like this. It came to me. And I remember years ago, when I went to the University of Oklahoma, finally referred to as the Harvard of the South. And, uh, <laughs> and I went up there, fortunate enough, on, on an athletic scholarship. You know, I was going to get a chance to come out and play football somewhere. Well, if the name out of Dallas, that's where I was raised, everybody said, go down and play for Texas. You know, you're from right here in Dallas, represent your state. But with a name like Patrick O'Dooley, where else do you think I might be drawn? Notre Dame. Notre Dame, exactly, yeah. Oh, Dooley, Notre Dame almost sounds like, doesn't it? So this is in the mid-60s when Notre Dame and Texas played each other several times for big championship games. They're big rivals. And I had these two giant football teams fighting over me. See, Texas wanted me to go to Notre Dame. Notre Dame wanted me to go to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I simply went up to the one that paid the most. I mean, had the highest educational requirements. <laughs> so I got up there. Now, this is what got to be scary. I started thinking about it. It just came to, to mind last week during that game we had. And when I went up there as a freshman, we could not play on the freshman team the way uh, freshmen <coughs> can now. You had, to, you had to play freshman football. You couldn't play on the varsity whatsoever. And basically all we were were live bait for the varsity, whoever they're playing the next week. <laughs> when our team, Bill knows, yeah. Uh, well, when, uh, when I was a freshman, we had an open week before we played Texas. Not even a conference game, but it was the hardest two weeks we had of the entire year. Jason, you'd be thankful we weren't playing for the Sooners in. As freshmen, we were getting killed. And uh, we had this big all-American linebacker on our team named Carl McAdams from White Deer, Texas, a monster of a guy. And uh, he'd signed with the with the Miami, uh, I mean the Minnesota Dolphins, uh, Minnesota Vikings, and came back and had a big ten thousand dollar bonus. I said, "What are you going to do with all that money, Carl?" So I'm going to take ninety percent of it and spend it on Irish whiskey and women. So what are you going to do with the rest of it? So I'm going to squander that part. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> so here we were getting ready for the, the game, and, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget it because our quarterback had come out, and all our plays were drawn out. And he'd lay that play down. I'd look at that play wherever my position was. Well, I had number 82 on. Number 82 was at Texas that time was a guy named Carl, uh, uh, Carl uh, McAdams. No, Carl McAdams. Um, their leading receiver at that time, I tried to put it out of my mind, it was so dreadful. So Cotton Spire. Cotton Spire. And I had his number, I had his name, and I was a big part of the offense because he was just killing everybody. So anyway, I was worked over so bad. The last day in practice, here came our quarterback out there, Bobby Warmack. He said, Now come on, guys, we got to get them ready. It's the last day in pads. So get out there. So I looked at that first play. Greg, I didn't want to run that first play because that play showed little old me blocking down on our All-American linebacker, Carl McAdams. But being the leader that he was, he said, now come on guys, we got to get them ready. Well, gentlemen, we're all called to be leaders in our own spheres of influence, our homes, our families, and our, our businesses. We're called to do things sometimes that are not easy. So he said, all right, it'll be on one. Well, I went out there and lined up and he called out those two on hot one. And I came out there like a ball of fire, just like it was drawn. It went right past the linebacker in front of me because he thought I was going to go out for a pass. Well, just as I did, I made my turn. And I came right down the line faster and quicker. I'm coming right at Carl McAdams, full speed. <laughs> he doesn't see me coming. <laughs> in other words, Ed, I was going to get a blind side hit on him. Well, I came in there and hit him. Pow! End over end over end. I smacked him. And when you get a good hit like that, you kind of strut back to the hook. You know what I'm saying, Greg? Like a big sale. Real estate sale. Man, I'm strutting back, patting myself on the shoulder. So, oh, son, you done good, buddy. As I did, I looked back and I saw him coming. No, it wasn't Carl McAdams. It was our coach. Coach Mad Dog James, we called him. We called Coach James Mad Dog because when he got mad and excited, his mouth foamed up like a mad dog. <laughs> and after you've seen some people just like that, I was thinking like that because, you know, as we look at that, I, I was looking for a scripture to point that out. And sure enough, Jason is right on your board. Joshua said, one night, said, I have commanded you. <laughs> To be not afraid nor dismayed because the Lord your God is with you. To be of good courage. He didn't say, I want you to be strong. He said, I have commanded you to do that. 
Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Now, I wasn't a Christian at that time. I thought I was, but I wasn't. And I was scared to death. Because when McAdams went run over there, coach went over, and McAdams was still laying on the ground. He picked him up by the face mask, yanked him up in there, and said, What are you going to do, McAdams? Let some little freshman knock you on your can? What are you going to do in front of 30 million people? Now run it again! <laughs> so, I get to do it all over again. <laughs> Only this time, he knows what's going to happen. <laughs> And I know what's going to happen. <laughs> and everybody else kind of got out of the way. <laughs> but see, the point is, we all go through there, and that's about being afraid. And I just said, Isaiah 41, 6 said, Fear not, for I am with you always, gentlemen. Now here's the point. I don't know if you've ever been afraid of something like that. We've all been in fearful places. The good news is we can call upon the Lord, didn't we? Right. We can call upon Him in our fearful time to know that He is with us. And I just never forget because as I went and ran that next play, as fearful as I was, um, when I woke up, <laughs> see, <laughs> see, he knew it, and he gave me a forearm shiver, Greg, like you've never seen. Flip me over backwards. But the point is, I thought about that some 30, 40 years ago when I was preparing for this, thinking about being fearful. And so the boats remind you that God's in control. He's got the power. The airplane recognizes that we've got a hidden fuel cell inside of us. And the, and the being fearful recognizes that all of us have a fear we have to overcome. And so consequently I was thinking because I like to stay I like to grow like I do. And I don't want to have everybody leave without giving you something you can apply in your life. So I heard a great sermon by my daughter's minister up in North Carolina a while back that changed something about what I do because I've learned years ago that to stay on track. Now as a former professional pilot I can tell you when an airplane flying anywhere it's off course more than it's on course. Maybe it's constantly getting back on but you're off course. You're getting blown off course. And the same thing with us men. We're getting blown off course by the, the challenging world that we live in. And so I heard this sermon and he talked, this minister talked about his grandfather, apparently a great man that he had had and that he looked up to him. And his grandfather was trying to work with his wife of over 45 years who had just gone in the stages of Alzheimer's and apparently it was real bad. And he said he'd go in there and his wife would scream at him and curse at him and he would still go and brush her hair and do everything he possibly could. He said, the thing I remember about Grandpa is that when you ask him how he was, he'd always say, 100%. And I thought about that. So, you know, here he was going through the darkest time of his life, everything he had built up, and he was saying 100%, and it wasn't true. Well, you know, we ended up dying before his uh, wife did. And I thought about that all, all along, he said, as... I, and I think, how could he be 100%? Because he wasn't 50%. He, he wasn't even 10%. Yet he always said he's 100%. He said, one day while I was praying, it came to me. It came to me this way. He said, you're 100% depending on what you're measuring. See, if you're measuring circumstances, he's not 100%. But if you're measuring faithfulness in the Lord... If you're measuring a, a, a Christ that's going to be with us, if you're measuring an eternal home, if you're measuring what God's going to do for us, all of us are 100%. Now let me put it this way, gentlemen. I don't know all of you, but I do know this. Everybody in here is in the middle of pain. You're coming out of pain. Or you're getting ready to go in pain. That's the life we live in. And the Bible says that that we're going to have trouble in the world, but thank goodness the Lord has overcome the world. And so consequently, the pain that we have, you cannot equate the pain of the condition and the circumstance into the condition that you have. And so you think about that, some of us in here are not 100%, obviously not. Some of you are not 50%. There's some of you in here probably in single digits. But here's the key. It always goes back to what you're measuring. And I submit to you this, that don't let the conditions you do because God is going to give you 100% of all he has 
100% of the time. Right. You are 100%. And what that does, gentlemen, is you say 100%, your conscious mind, which God gives us, says, you know, I'm in control of this. With God's help, I can do this. And you're not, because one person said, well, aren't you telling a lie? You're not 100%. Sure I am. It depends on what you're measuring, doesn't it? Say yes. Yes. It depends on what you're measuring. So I just say, yes, I am 100%. And here's the key. As you go through and go and meet people, and they come up and you say, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, how are you? Try saying 100% and watch the expressions on people's faces. Great, particularly people you meet in real estate. How could you be 100%? You look at, because it depends on what you're measuring. You don't have to explain that. So Ed, I just implore you to, to go ahead and try that. And of course, God knew what he was doing. Because if I were to say, say 100%, when you walk out of here, I know for a fact, it's proven, you will forget 75% of what I said within 48 hours. That's a proven fact. Right, David? You're a speaker. You know that. So what I want to do is give you something that you could walk away with. So, Greg, you take one of those and just strip it right down. You just tear a dot off and strip it right on down. And what this dot is, this is what I call a psychological triggering device. And you can put it on your watch. If you don't have a watch, put it on your cell phone. If you don't have a cell phone, put it on your MasterCard. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I use a watch is because according to psychological surveys, the average American looks at their watch 23 times a day. So if you look at your watch 23 times a day, David, and you see that green dot, what is that going to be a reminder for you? I'm 100%, right? Now let me tell you where it comes from. You go back to Numbers 1537. God knew what he's doing. God told Moses, said, what I want you to do, tell the Israelites, I, what I want you to do is wear tassels on the corners of your clothes. And you wear, the reason you wear those tassels, which are blue, is because it will remind you to keep the commandments. God knew we'd forget about them. It's a reminder. All this is is a reminder for you gentlemen that uh, you're 100% with Christ 100% of the time. Now you're going to have people come up and say, excuse me, uh, Mike, but there's a green dot on your watch. <laughs> or Jason or Brad, anybody. So what you're going to do is say, hey, what's the green dot mean? Say, I'm green and growing, reminding me I'm 100%. And gentlemen, that's what we have here as we leave something to, to walk out of here with today. And that old saying that says, the only tool you have is a hammer. Everything looks like a nail. <laughs> so I want to give you something to walk out of here with. Boats remind you God's in control. He's got the power, right? Right? Right. Yes. Airplane says we've all got a hidden fuel cell inside of us waiting to be tapped. Scary things recognize that throughout life God said he commanded us to not be afraid and to be of good courage that he's going to be with us. And the good thing is we're 100% no matter where we are depends on what you're measuring. God bless you all. Thanks a lot.